Uh -huh. So we have people entering the room. That's fantastic. So uh, good day, everyone. And before I forget, please uh, fill the evaluation form of yesterday. That's going to be put in the chat. It will take a couple of minutes, but we really would like to hear from you, uh, hoping that everything goes fine, but feel free to let us know if it's not the case. Um, just looking at the number of people entering the, the room. Okay, so I think we can start slowly but surely. Uh, we hope all is well on your side and a warm welcome to the marketplace when you will have the chance to meet with all the working groups and task forces leads to learn more about the work they are doing. I love Marketplace Day. Uh, they will be pitching their session and then you will have to choose which groups, which session you want to attend. But before doing so, time has come to start the day with the hot of the press session, <laughs> very hot of the press. Um, so what do we have on the menu today? Well. We will be hearing about some exciting resources coming from different working groups and task forces, including learning and development working group, community uh, level child protection task force, child protection minimum standards working group, the child labor task force, and the children associated with armed force and armed group task force. Are you ready? If so, put a thumb up in your, near your camera using the reaction button. And we're going to move straight away uh, to the first group. And I'm very pleased to welcome our first presenters, the LD Working Group leads, Elena Giannini and Katy Robertson. Thank you, Audrey. And um, welcome, everyone, again uh, on this special day, the Marketplace Day. So I just am going to do a quick introduction of ourselves in case you have missed us. So my name is Elena Giannini, and I am the Learning and Development Working Group Focal Point together with Katie Robertson, whom you can either see on this side of the screen or on that side of the screen, I'm unsure. And um, yeah, we have prepared a very short video for you to catch up on what we have released over the course of the last few months. So there's quite a lot in there. So in case you need like any help with that, do reach out, we'll drop our email address in the chat box and Julie, you can take us away with the video. The Learning and Development Working Group at the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action is pleased to announce that the following products are now available. Our new strategy sets out our objectives, learning approach, principles and key actions to inform learning and development at the Alliance in the coming years. The strategy is currently available in English, French and Spanish. A one-page infographic highlighting the key points from the strategy is also available in English, French, Spanish and Arabic. The Child Protection in Humanitarian Action Competency Framework, which we released in 2020, is now available also in French and Spanish. And we, also, we have also developed some accompanying tools to uh, facilitate its use in staff recruitment, performance management, etc. These tools include a three hours face to face uh, training or remotely facilitated training session on the purpose, structure, and content of the framework, a tool uh, to use the framework in drafting job descriptions another one to facilitate the use of the competency framework in, uh, in competency-based interviews, and finally, a tool to uh, facilitate the use of the framework in uh, performance management. The l and Toolkit is available in English, French, and Spanish. It contains a series of guidance, tools, and templates for CPHA practitioners who are involved in designing and delivering training and learning activities, but who are not learning and development experts by background. The toolkit can support you with assessing learning needs, designing and developing learning activities, implementing and evaluating training and learning. With the generous support of the American people through the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance at the United States Agency for International Development, we have developed a series of COVID-19 learning resources, including case studies and webinars on innovative approaches to capacity strengthening during COVID-19. A video series on safely using platforms and apps for remote programming. 
Massive open online courts on protecting children during COVID-19 and other infectious diseases outbreak, which has been adapted to run on demand in English and Spanish, now featuring on Future Learn platform. Eight new face-to-face and remotely facilitated child protection learning modules. Transitioning to remote case management during COVID-19. Delivering case management via phone. Preventing family separation during COVID-19. Child protection mainstreaming in health facilities. CAFAG and COVID-19. CAFAG programme continuity during COVID-19. Promoting mental health and psychosocial well-being of children during COVID-19. Supporting children, families and communities during COVID-19. Plus a module on delivering training remotely to support the rollout of the modules where face-to-face training is not possible. 10 learning tools including tip sheets, posters and animation. A webinar series available on the Alliance YouTube channel. English versions of all resources are now available on the Alliance website and French, Spanish and Arabic version will be available by the end of October the latest. For more information, join the L&D Working Group events at the annual meeting or contact us on learning at alliancecpha.org. Yeah, and that's all from our side. We'll drop like the link to the website with all the COVID-19 resources and the LND page of the Learning and Development Working Group in the chat shortly. Over to you, Audrey. Thank you so much, ladies. Wow, such an amazing presentation and wow, great work done here. If you agree with me, everyone, please use the reaction uh, button and uh, share your appreciation and your mood before we move to our next speaker. Uh, and I'm very pleased to uh, welcome uh, Michelle Van Ankin representing the Community Level Child Protection Task Force and as well the Community Engagement in Case Management Project. Michelle, the floor is yours. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, so I will be presenting on the exploratory uh, report on community engagement in case management, um, community volunteers and their roles in case management processes and humanitarian contexts. Um, however, I would like to start with a um, video, if that's possible. Um, I think the video has been shared. Um, and this is a video celebrating community volunteers. They are our neighbors, a friend, a listener, an interpreter, a guide. They notice when we are facing problems and are the first ones to respond. They open doors for us, and as we go to new places, they are right there with us, by our side. They are appreciated in our community, working all day long for children like us. They understand and advise us. They encourage and support us. Sometimes they take risks for us. They are our translators and interpreters when no one understands. They help us solve problems. They listen to us in confidence and trust. They are beside us so we can be brave. They help us stay safe. They are far more than neighbors to us. They look after us, empower and protect us. They value us and we value them. This year, more than ever, volunteers have played a vital role on the front line of child protection. Celebrate the value of volunteers on 5 December, International Volunteer Day. All right, thank you. Um, and if we can move to the PowerPoint now too. Um, so under this project, which is funded by the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, we conducted from uh, 2020 from through 2020 through 
uh, the beginning of 2021, an exploratory research study looking at how we, we as a child protection community are engaging volunteers in case management. Um, next slide. Thank you. The aim of the research was to better understand um, how community volunteers are engaged in case management um, and their responsibilities within the case management process. So really trying to look at, you know, are we engaging community volunteers? What are the, how are they being engaged? What are the responsibilities and what are the support that we're, we're providing them? Um, just to be clear, we, I know that in child protection, as well as in broader humanitarian work, we engage volunteers from the communities that we work in, in many different aspects of our work. But for this project and for this research, it was very specifically looking at community members engaged in aspects of child protection case management activities alongside NGOs and community-based organizations. So very narrow in scope, but with a very rich findings. Um, next slide, please. The research was very comprehensive. So we conducted a desk review um, of peer-reviewed articles and gray literature that included SOPs for um, case management, in terms of references for volunteers, trainings that were used with volunteers, to have an understanding of um, both what's the evidence from, the, um, from the, the literature as well as what's happening in reality. We conducted 32 key informant interviews with academics and advisors, as well as child protection managers and coordinators and supervisors of volunteers to again kind of understand what's the theory behind how we're engaging volunteers, what's the theoretical higher level understanding of that engagement versus what is the reality on the ground. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we weren't just speaking with um, child protection managers and academics. We wanted to actually, or you know, child protection workers, we wanted to speak with, with um, volunteers themselves. And so we collected 68 photo stories um, from volunteers to give us a better understanding of their reality and how they perceive their role as a volunteer. Um, and then we also conducted field research where we collected four case studies um, through a series of workshops with managers and volunteers. And so this gave us a better understanding of the reality in context. And what we really found was a correlation between the evidence review and the field research. Um, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So the field research was conducted in Myanmar, Nigeria, and in Malawi. And actually currently, um, Colleen, who is the project lead for this community engagement and case management piece of work is in Mozambique piloting the toolkit that has been developed as a result of the research. So that's very exciting. We'll be adding an additional country context um, to pilot the resources. Um, in Myanmar, we worked in Kachin and Magwe um, with both uh, CBOs implementing case management with support from INGOs, as well as an INGO implementing case management in an urban setting. Nigeria, we had a similar um, uh, examples of, of support uh, of organizations we were working with in Borno State, again, a local NGO implementing case management, and then as well as an INGO. And in Malawi, we worked in Zaleka and Bachinga, um, again, with in one case an international NGO and in one case a local NGO. So really to give us this rich understanding of, across a variety of organizations, as well as a variety of contexts from um, natural disaster response in Bachinga to ongoing conflict in Nigeria um, and, a, and a protracted crisis in Kachin. States. So to really give us a rich understanding across a variety of contexts. Um, next slide, please. So one of the key findings was that um, volunteers in case management have a mixture of many different roles and responsibilities, but that there are three main types. Um, you can click through so that we get the, the animation. Um, type one is a volunteer. So this person, you know, is volunteering their time. They're not necessarily receiving an incentive and they generally have the lowest level of responsibilities. The second type is an incentivized worker. Um, so who may be involved in more light level of case management work, identification and referral of cases, and maybe, 
immediately providing support to an emergency case um, if it's not possible for the child protection actor to immediately respond. They receive a small incentive. It might be a small amount of money. It might be um, t-shirts and those kind of materials. And then type three is a paraprofessional or a caseworker. And this person, while still technically on a volunteer contract, does go through the whole, all of the steps of case management, um, generally receives the full case management training, but for whatever reason, in that, that context may not be able to be hired as full-time staff. So for example, in many refugee contexts, refugees don't have the right to work, um, so they are serve as volunteers, um, or in situations of statelessness. Now, the differences along this continuum is that essentially education level, the amount of training and supervision received, the remuneration, the level of responsibility, the risk level of cases, the hours dedicated to work all increase along the spectrum in theory. So you wouldn't necessarily have a type one volunteer going through all the steps of case management and taking on high risk cases. Um, however, uh, what the research showed is that in reality, responsibility, there, there's not this clear division. And very frequently, there's an unbalanced expectation on volunteers um, who have limited payment, training, and support. Um, so for example, most often we would see type two incentivized workers who um, end up doing a full, the full case management process without, with limited training, limited supervision, and receiving very minimal payment. Um, this has implications for the volunteers, for the children they're supporting, for the families they're working with, for the communities they're engaged with, as well as for the effectiveness of the case management program. Um, and this was kind of one of our main findings is that we really need to look at what are we asking volunteers to do? And does that really count as volunteering or is that work? Um, next slide. Um, so the we have six key messages that I would like you to take away, and this will be um, I'm trying to be mindful of time. Uh, so the first is that volunteers do bring benefits. Um, they understand the communities they're working with. They have, they speak the same language. They have that contextual understanding, but they're often under-resourced and overutilized to be considered volunteers. Um, the second is that this mixture of unclear roles, lack of support for volunteering, and the power dynamics, both between the NGO and the volunteer as well as the volunteer and the community they're supporting leads to an unsustainable model and potentially can lead to an exploitative dynamic where we've actually in our research have had volunteers who say they feel like this is exploitative, um, which is not something you want to hear. Um, communities must be involved in all aspects of volunteer engagement from agreeing on what will be the role of volunteers to the selection process. Um, Volunteers face many risks um, in the work that they do, and children and families also face risks, um, and these should be mitigated as much as possible. Um, so both in terms of risks volunteers face in terms of the work, the sensitive work they're doing in community, but also the risks that children and families might face from having volunteers that are so involved in case management processes. Um, child protection partners must harmonize approaches and standards for volunteer engagement. Now, I know thinking, you know, in many contexts, you have to harmonize incentive rates, you have to harmonize how you're engaging volunteers. And so this does need to happen, but it needs to happen in an ethical manner where we're ensuring that we're not asking volunteers to take on a full time job. And if we are, that we're remunerating them properly. Um, and then finally, of course, there's an urgent need to invest in the child protection workforce. Um, of course, there's been a move engaging more volunteers in case management work. Um, we are, as a sector, facing chronic underfunding, and this is why we have seen this shift to relying more on volunteers, um, and also because there's an element of sustainability there by building up the capacity of the local community. Um, but we do need to invest in the child protection workforce. Case management is a highly technical area of work that should be carried out by a team of people who are properly trained and remunerated for that work. Um, next slide. Thank you. So um, in addition to this uh, research report, uh, this comparative study, which is 60 pages, and recognizing that most people don't have time to read 60 pages, we also have a study brief that's summarizing the key findings and recommendations that's available in Arabic, French, and English, and Spanish. We have a policy brief um, 
targeting donors, policymakers, UN agencies, the senior management teams at the country office level who may not understand why we need to rethink how we're engaging volunteers in case management to really make it clear what are the key messages and why is this important. And then of course we have a poster of seven best practices to support community volunteers. Um, this is specifically for child protection teams um, to you know, be able to hang in on the wall to really think through how are we working with volunteers and to kind of distill these key messages even further. Um, next slide. And then what's next? So we have developed a toolkit for community volunteers engaged in case management um, that provides guidance on how to ethically involve community volunteers, as well as 18 tools for implementing this guidance. And there's, we also have a training manual to train, support, and empower community volunteers um, that is divided into a core training, additional trainings, and then workshops that can be done with both the child protection team and the um, and the volunteers and these are designed to be done without powerpoints be done in low tech contexts where it really is just sitting and and talking and having a conversation with with the volunteers and focusing on what do they really need to do how to do their job um, so these are currently under review and we will be sharing them in january um, thank you so much i hope i didn't go over time <laughs> you are right on time you could be, uh, yeah, well done. You always manage to be right on time and deliver a lot of information. Uh, thank you so much for that brief presentation around the work you're doing um, for around community volunteers. Uh, same people, please share what you're feeling using your reaction button. Let us know how you feel so far. I would say that I've personally been very interested following up this particular project throughout the past year. Uh, because we, we have all and we are all working with community volunteers and I think this research has kind of uh, put under the spotlight not only the work that uh, they have been doing uh, but as well the way we include them in, in programming. So thank you for that. Um, I'll try to remain on time now and uh, passing turning now to Susanna Davis, uh, one of the two colleagues of the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group. Susanna, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Audrey. And um, it's a pleasure to be amongst uh, such a group of amazing colleagues who are doing so many different interesting pieces of work. Um, so on behalf of the CPMS Working Group, I'm gonna introduce you to um, a new kind of updated version of our website and take you on a bit of a whistle-stop tour of many of the resources uh, that we've been developing over the past year and particularly focusing on this um, new microsite that we have on working across sectors. But we'll start at the main page, um, which you can see the producers really helpfully already put it up now. And this is just like a slight redesign. We tried to make it easier for colleagues to kind of find the resources. So if you scroll down, you can kind of immediately access the standards and introduction video, a little bit about what the working group is doing. And of course, see all of our wonderful members who make our work possible. Um, so that's just kind of your entry point. And if we scroll up and we click on the CPMS further resources page, um, which is that sort of purple button down here. That will take you to, to the main page, which is sort of your library of all of the CPMS resources that are available. Some which you might know already, many of which have been developed over the last year. So maybe you haven't seen them yet. Um, so you'll see kind of at the top, we are, we're trying to keep like little news stories to let you know what's going on. Um, and you can access, see all the different ways you can access the handbook. Um, the implementation toolkit comes straight after that. And as you scroll down, you'll just see um, this is sort of your one-stop shop for all of the different tools you have to help support you implement the standards at the country level in your organization. You can access our videos, the further readings, um, and 
all everything's there for you to kind of explore. So I won't take you through each of these in details right now, um, but just encourage you kind of after the um, after the dis after the session today, when you have a moment, go and have a look and see if there are new things that maybe you haven't seen before. Um, but what we're going to spend a bit more time on, and I'm particularly excited to share with you today, is if we can look at the working across sectors. Um, microsite was just the next page and you probably saw that kind of headline of the working across sectors piece um, so that's this one um, and as you might know and you might have heard uh, if you participated in some of the strategy sessions yesterday um, that this working across sectors piece um, is kind of a new initiative and an increasing area of work for the CPMS working group over the next couple of years. But also really importantly, it's a key priority for the whole of the Alliance. And it was um, this links into um, that strategic priority three on multi-sectoral coordination and collaboration. Um, so here on this website, it's one that we've we've put together now. It's available in four languages, but we'll be building it out um, over the over the next year and expanding it as a resource library. So the first thing we want to share with you, in case you haven't seen it before, is our new video that's introducing um, CPMS pillar uh, pillar four working across sectors and we're just going to watch a little clip of it now um, so you can kind of get a flavor for what's included there. This video is part of a series exploring the minimum standards for child protection in humanitarian action or the CPMS. As part of the humanitarian standards partnership this set of 10 principles 28 standards and accompanying guidance is key for all humanitarians as we work to fulfill our duties toward children in this video we look at pillar 4 the standards to work across sectors millions of children are facing increasingly complex humanitarian crises helping them cope and recover takes a wide range of support including specialized child protection interventions but no single sector has all the knowledge, skills, and resources to fully prevent risks, respond to children's rights to be protected from violence, abuse, exploitation, and neglect, and promote their well-being. Children are, are whole beings. They're not, uh, they're not sectors, right? They don't divide their lives up in sectors. And so we, we know that, you know, if you're trying to assist someone who's been impacted by a humanitarian crisis, uh, particularly children, you really need to think holistically. By taking a holistic and multi-sectoral approach, we can achieve not only our collective responsibility to uphold the centrality of protection, but also build stronger, more effective programs that improve outcomes for every child. Thanks very much. So that was just a quick clip of the video. We do encourage you to go and have a look at it and watch the whole thing when you have a bit longer. It's available in four languages, so in English, uh, French, Spanish, and Arabic. And this is really a great uh, introduction to cross-sectoral collaboration for children's protection and well-being. Um, and it's something that you can use within your own agency um, or with interagency partners to kind of explore how you can work together to advance the centrality of children and their protection across all sectors of, of the humanitarian response. Um, if I can ask the producer just to put the pillar for uh, the working across sectors website back up for a moment. Um, so I just wanted to um, briefly introduce you to kind of the other tools that are there. So if we scroll down a little bit, you can just see that there are links to the, the introduction um, to the working across sector standards, which will kind of describe to you some of the key approaches if you haven't explored that before. And that there are now um, all of these sector buttons that are there. So when you click on one of these sector buttons, you'll be able to download the standard that's the CPMS standard that's associated with that sector. And over time, we'll be adding kind of new resources um, 
and to support collaboration across sectors. So this is something we'll continue to be building out. Um, just as like a quick example, by the end of this year, um, we'll be doing a series of evidence reviews on the impact of cross-sectoral collaboration with health, uh, education, with, with a few other sectors, and these will be available on this uh, site. Next year, the CPMS Working Group will be developing, um, together with our colleagues uh, across the Alliance, some new learning packages, e-modules, advocacy tools, and other practical resources to help drive forward cross-sectoral collaboration for children's protection. So we're really hoping that this site uh, will become an easily accessible library, not just for the child protection community, but also for the wider humanitarian community and our colleagues who are working in other sectors um, to give them a practical set of tools and a landing space um, on where they can access them. So that's my quick tour. Um, and before I just wrap up our, our little snippet and hand over to my next colleagues, I wanted to um, give you a little bit of a call to action. So you've had a chance to see all the resources available. You've got the links to the Working Across Sectors page in, in the Zoom chat. Um, I would encourage you, if you can, pick up your phone, open a new browser window on your computer and go to whatever social media platform you use most to communicate with work colleagues. Maybe that's LinkedIn, maybe that's Slack, maybe you're on Facebook, maybe it's WhatsApp, whatever it is, open it up, share the Working Across Sectors website and tag a few of your colleagues. Um, in the next month, maybe you can schedule a meeting with them to discuss to watch the whole video together. It's available in four languages. You can choose whichever you prefer and discuss how you can advance cross-sectoral collaboration for children's protection in your teams. You might have a chat about how you can use the standards in CPMS Pillar 4 to improve your own programming or look at how you can use them to strengthen collaboration at the interagency level. Um, there's a lot coming from the CPMS working group on this over the next year, and we're really excited uh, to work together with you and make sure that you have kind of access to all the, the tools and the support that you need. So um, thanks very much for the time and do, do be in touch if you're interested in collaborating on this as well. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Susanna, for this uh, presentation. And I don't know how you're doing, guys, within the CPMS working group, but I keep, learn I keep learning stuff just watching at your presentation. So I would say let's go to the reaction button, and I think this one deserves at least a thumb up. All right, everyone? Are you still with me? Are you still ready to learn more about what is happening in our Hot of the Press session? If so, I will hand over to the next speakers, uh, Simon Hills and Sylvia Onate from the Child Labor Task Force. You guys, the floor is yours. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, we're very excited to be with you today. There's like a lot of new resources, so it's super exciting. Um, so today, the Child Labor Task Force, we're very excited that we are pleased to present the new interagency toolkit called Preventing and Responding to Child Labor in Humanitarian Action. And we'd like to introduce it uh, by sharing first like a video that actually we used during our global launch. And it's from Molly, it's a youth advocate in Uganda. So we'd like to play this very short video of uh, over a minute to start uh, our short presentation. My name is Molly, I'm a program officer at Ecological Christian Organization where I manage projects aimed at elimination of child labor and child trafficking in various regions of Uganda. I'm a youth advocate, very passionate about working with youth and children. And I dream of a world where there is no child labor and all child rights are respected. I was once in child labor at the age of 11 after the death of my parents. And my heart still bleeds because I know over 2 million children still go through the same in my country. And the numbers go higher and higher all over the globe. In a humanitarian crisis, child labor significantly increases, changes, and becomes more complex to address. This therefore calls for multi-sectoral response, as well as engaging and working with the children and adolescents themselves. Join me and a team of committed people on the 23rd of March, 2021, at the virtual launch of the Interagency Toolkit 
a guide for humanitarian actors and other agencies in the global community to effectively work together to prevent and respond to child labor in humanitarian action. So as you can see, the, the toolkit's been live since March, but um, please do check it out if you haven't done so yet. The toolkit can, toolkit can be easily navigated. It contains more than 30 case studies and many practical tools. Um, we're currently working on some of the accompanying regional versions and a training package with re pre-recorded webinars should soon be ready as well alongside a facilitator's guide and slide decks. And today, what we want to use this short time that we have is to demonstrate how the toolkit that actually focus, uh, has a, like a really strong focus on prevention, like the theme of the Alliance uh, meeting this year, can practically help practitioners and frontline workers. So we want to make sure we share some examples uh, on how it can help you with uh, four few real scenario examples. So maybe like, uh, Simon, can you start with the first scenario? Sure. Scenario one. In the onset of a food insecurity crisis, colleagues from different agencies were asked to support efforts for a joint multi-sectoral assessment. Colleagues needed arguments to make sure child labour was integrated and looked at. Part, and looked at part one of the toolkit on why we should act on child labour in humanitarian settings, including global trends, clarity on child labour concepts and risks. They also check the section on assessment for defining what we need to know, child labour indicators, actions for involving children in data collection, and a tool for measuring child labour in humanitarian settings. Thank you, Simon. Another scenario from colleagues in, in another context, um, we're like working with different agencies in a country on child protection and also uh, in the government, identify child labour as the main concern on the rise. So that might be also a situation for some of the practitioners listening today. In order to set up and manage a child labor task force at national level, they actually check the part two of the toolkit uh, that is on quality response, including a section on coordination. So what colleagues did, they went through all the highlighted key actions for coordinating child labor and humanitarian action. They also look at the different examples on how can this be done by a lead sector, by multiple sectors, or by a government agency. And they also check the a case study that is highlighted in the toolkit uh, from Turkey, that which is on the establishment of a national level child labor technical working group uh, to provide guidance and coordination on child labor in the context of Syria crisis. And finally, colleagues also check a practical tool called coordinators checklist that provided in detail actions for coordinators. So that's the second example that might be also useful for you when you actually, uh, when you face in, in your current work. And over to Simon for the third scenario. Uh, talking of current work, imagine a, uh, during the pandemic, so we're all facing the crisis and everywhere at the moment and still ongoing. So during, during the current situation and crisis, colleagues coordinating child protection in a response identify increase, increases in the prevalence of child labour risks and prevalence um, in rates and face challenges in advocating and supporting members' programming. They checked in uh, part three of the toolkit on prevention and response programme actions, uh, as this includes a section on programming in diverse contexts and infectious disease outbreaks. Colleagues checked how epidemics can affect children who are in or at risk of child labour in different ways and detailed guidance tool highlighting child labour risks and also proposing programme adaptations. Back over to you, Sylvia. And um, uh, the fourth scenario that we wanted to highlight today is about colleagues that were working on a consortium on child protection and also multi-sectoral interventions. And they identified child labor as one of the main protection risks on the rise. And they were looking at developing joint messaging to share with adolescents, with parents and caregivers, and also with communities to complement the existing interventions. But they also wanted to mark the International Day Against Child Labor 
the Day of the Girl, and also the 2021 UN Year on the Elimination of uh, Child Labor. So what they did, uh, colleagues checked the part four of the toolkit, uh, which is a core implementation actions. And that section, that part has a section on communication and advocacy. So it provided key actions, topics, and also elements for developing child labor key messages and aware awareness raising strategies. Uh, what the colleagues also like from the consortium, they did, they, they use and adapt the tool called child labor key messages and they adapted for different audiences. And it includes like myths and also key messages. Over to you, Simon. Yeah. No, thanks for that. And um, I hope these uh, few examples have been uh, useful to those listening in. This, this list which we've given is far from exhaustive. To, or exhaustive. Um, there are many more within the toolkit, so we do really uh, think you should check it out. Um, the toolkit as well is divided into four parts following program cycle and is in line with CPMS, including multi-sectoral interventions, prevention and response actions at multiple levels from child, the family, community and society. And we think at least it's easily navigated thanks to icons and links. And, and I'm sure for those of you who've already seen that, you can uh, confirm that. Um, the link to it is obviously up on the screen at the moment, so please do uh, check it out. Back over to you, Sylvia. Uh, now we want to invite like all of you um, to visit the Child Labor Task Force microsite. So you see it in the, in the screen, it's shared by the producer, but it's also in the chat, where you'll see information about the Child Labor Task Force and also the Standard 12 uh, on Child Labor from the Child Protection Minimum Standards. By clicking on these boxes, you can get to download and access the toolkit for printing or accessing online, the two-page summary and translations, the case studies and practical tools available independently, the training package to be ready soon with facilitator's guide, additional resources, a set of slide decks for the 15 modules, pre-recorded webinars, and a link to child labor module CPMS 12. Uh, and also there is the contact uh, information for the Child Labour Task Force and myself and Sylvia as well. So please, we want to ask all of you to share it widely, but also to get in touch with us if you need more information about the resources, about the tools, but also if you need support in navigating the resources, or if you can offer some support in the rollout uh, of the toolkit, the training package in your country, your region or your organisation. Uh, we are available and we'll be also uh, having more time to discuss over like the marketplace session. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Sylvia and, and Simon for this uh, very uh, fantastic presentation. I just wanted to kind of um, emphasize one of the things you've said is that 2021 marks the international year for the elimination of child labor. And while we are still in October, we still have a couple of months ahead. Uh, and so still an opportunity uh, to mobilize forces and, uh, and address and tackling this, this issue. So this said, um, last but not least, I would like to introduce our next presenter, Sandra Mignon and Alexandra Blackwell uh, from the uh, Children Associated with Armed Force and Armed Group Task Force for their presentation. Ladies, the floor is yours. Thank you, Audrey. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Sandra Mignon. I'm working with uh, Plan International as a co-lead of the CAFAC Task Force. And uh, today, the CAFAC Task Force would like to present you two tools. So there is a technical note on girls associated with armed forces and armed groups um, that was developed by UNICEF and Plan International that I will present. And there is also a parenting skills package that is developed by IRC that will be presented by Alexandra Blackwell. So first, uh, let's talk about the technical note. So this technical note responds to a gap that was highlighted by field actors on how to program safely for girls. Um, it's often difficult to identify girls' CAFAG. They tend to hide in the communities. Um, they often don't want to be identified out of fear of uh, stigmatization. So this technical note provides recommendations and guidance 
uh, for field practitioners on how to practically program for girls CAFAG um, in a safe way. So in this technical note, you will find um, some information, uh, some background information um, on uh, that will include that includes information on the forms of recruitment, um, the risk factors that are specific to girls. Um, there are also information on their roles and responsibilities, and what is a life like uh, in an armed force or an armed group for girls. You will also find lessons learned and case studies from 14 countries, as well as recommendations focusing on prevention, release, and reintegration interventions. So there are a lot of recommendations uh, in this technical note uh, for all of this uh, various component, but I would like to highlight a few, a few overarching uh, recommendations. So the first one is that we need to develop and implement gender sensitive projects. Um, one of the big lessons learned throughout this, um, this technical note is that we, are, we tend to program only for boys or with boys in mind. And that, uh, as a result, then it's really hard to identify those girls. Um, and so the idea is to have, uh, is to develop gender sensitive projects. And to do that, we need to involve girls, uh, girls in the gender analysis that will then inform the program design. Uh, we need to involve them also during the implementation phase. Um, girls know what they need. Um, they know what could prevent recruitment. They know how we could facilitate their release uh, or their reintegration safely. So let's involve them throughout the project cycle. The second recommendation for field practitioners is to acknowledge girls' agency and the decision they may have taken at a time to join armed groups or armed forces that was based on their situation. And, and maybe that was you know, the best situation at the time from their perspective. So it's important to acknowledge that that decision, their uh, decision making process, so that we empower them to be actor of their reintegration and not just passive victims, just recipient of aid and, and not like meaningfully act for their life. Um, the third recommendation is to identify what I call community influencers. So these are allies in the community who have the power to shift social norms. So these are people who can make uh, recruitment unacceptable, who can improve community acceptance for girls uh, who come back with children. Um, it, they can also help uh, to relieve um, girls' guilt. Um, and that's particularly for religious leaders. So if you identify those key people, they have a lot more power than any organization to, to shift social norms to, um, and to influence the community in a way that will support the reintegration of girls. So I'm gonna stop here. I could speak for an hour on this technical note. Um, so it is available in English, in French, in Spanish, and in Arabic on the, on the website. Uh, there are also two webinar recordings uh, that are available, one in French and one in English. And so those resources are accessible on the CAFAG webpage of the Alliance website. And we have also a CAFAG task force YouTube channel where you can find a webinar recordings um, that we have developed. Um, so Julie, I don't know if you can add in the chat the link to the, um, if not, that's okay, I, I will do it. Um, and while I do that, I will hand over to Alexandra Blackwell. Alexandra, over to you. Thank you so much, Sandra. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Alexandra. I work with the International Rescue Committee, and I'm here to speak to you about our new intervention that we are launching very soon. Um, it's called Growing Stronger Together, and it's a parenting intervention for caregivers of children in conflict settings where there is recruitment into armed forces and armed groups. So the ultimate goal of the intervention is to support caregivers to better support their children 
to prevent child recruitment and facilitate their reintegration. Um, the intervention package and the testing and research we did around it was funded by the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. And um, we conducted formative research and a desk review to help inform the parenting curriculum. We also did some piloting in the Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, um, Nigeria, and now starting in Iraq as well. So the intervention is grounded in a framework that we developed based on the formative research with caregivers and adolescents to understand more about their experiences. And I spoke in more detail about this research yesterday, um, but this framework shows the drivers of recruitment from both perspectives. So we saw that caregivers and children had different views of the factors that influence children to engage in armed groups. Um, but we really wanted to keep children at the center. And so we see how um, these different factors, push and pull factors, including economic and other social factors um, are influencing the child's decision to join. Um, we also looked and learned about how mental health and parent-child relationships and other relationships within the, within the household were affecting the child's decision. And so I won't go into the details of this framework, but I think it's important to mention that um, this is a parenting intervention focusing on parents, but again, boys and girls are really remaining at the center, and we really use this framing to inform the development of the curriculum. Um, children's voices and perspectives remain at the center. We have home visit guidance and activities for parents that emphasize discussion and decision making with their children um, throughout the intervention and the resource pack. Some other considerations that were weaved throughout the modules and the curriculum and the guidance that accompanies it include um, contextualization. So we have guidance and key highlights for adaptation and examples of how the intervention and activities were adapted in different contexts. Um, we also bring up parental well being and self care approaches um, and different examples of these in different contexts um, to really bring that parental well-being component through um, and also allow for some sharing of strategies between parents participating in the program. Um, we really acknowledge the agency of boys and girls and the capacity that children have to make their own decisions and the need to involve them as actors in family decision making and discussions. Um, and then we also make some gender considerations and highlight the different experiences of boys and girls throughout the curriculum, um, as well as how male and female caregivers might be affected differently um, due to gender differences in discrimination and, and experiences. Um, and this is a very integrated intervention. So there are factors that cannot be addressed through a parenting intervention alone that um, strongly influence a child's decision, decision um, or, or predicament to join an armed group. And so it's very important to link with other sectors. Um, and for example, um, we rolled this parenting intervention out with a adolescent social and emotional learning component in one context um, and had a very integrated intervention. It could also be integrated with other economic uh, programs as well. Um, so I did want to also thank our technical reference group and members of the CAFAD task force, many of whom I see are uh, with us today for reviewing uh, the curriculum intervention and the different tools and guidance that accompany it. Um, the final intervention resource pack includes it, the intervention curriculum, a constant companion, which is guidance for facilitators to lead them through each session and activity, um, a home visit guide, outcome measurement guidance and training a facilitators package. And so this will be available in English and French um, in November and also very soon in Arabic as well. And I'll share the link to the webpage where those materials will be shared as well as um, we have other research reports, a desk review um, and soon the intervention pack in different languages. Um, and then we will also be having a launch event in November. So um, keep an eye out for that. Thanks very much. Back over to you, uh, Sandra. Oh, to me. That's not a problem. Back to <laughs> the Thank you so much, Alex, for uh, presenting that very interesting tool. 
Um, and thank you for all the presenter of the hot of the press session. This is, was just a kind of teaser of what will be the afternoon. Um, as you can see, um, I am personally very impressed by uh, not only the diversity of resources, but as well uh, the quality of the resources. Um, and this is, this is the work that we are all doing together because we have uh, obviously the working groups and task forces leads, but we have as well you um, as members uh, of the Alliance participating and supporting our effort. Uh, you can see um, that if you want to know more, we have obviously uh, the email address where you can reach out to uh, the um, different uh, presenters and groups uh, for this uh, first session, which, is, which was really the, the latest thing that came out. So now um, we are going to break uh, so an opportunity for you to stretch a little bit your legs, to have a cup of coffee, cup of tea, um, and then we will come back at uh, 2.40 CET time. So in about 14 minutes, if I look at my, at my watch, uh, to be able to hear for the first pitch uh, of the afternoon. And the pitch session uh, will oppose the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group and Case Management Task Force um, in front of the Assessment, Measurement and Evidence Working Group together with the Community Level Child Protection Task Force. And I know it's going to be a very, very uh, hard choice that you're going to have to face, but before for you to be able to take a decision, let's meet at 2.40 CET time in 14 minutes in the plenary session for to listen to this pitch. Um, a big thank you to all the presenters of this session. You can use the reaction box uh, to send some thumb up or bravo or anything you, you feel. And uh, talk to you very soon. Bye.